Welcome to the video help guide for section 4 which is uh, titled Data Collection. Um, the help for this uh, can be found in the book uh, pages 78 and 79. Uh, I would highly recommend you read through those pages to get uh, additional information and knowledge to help you better uh, complete this section. Now in this section you're going to explain and explore the how the how the data collection methods and data collection features uh, affects its reliability. And the main two methods of data collection revolve around primary data and secondary data, which you will have to explain. Um, so to put simply, you know, the word primary and secondary should give it away. Primary data, data is collected directly uh, from the original source and is referred as primary data. You can easily collect primary data yourself by creating a survey and asking people to complete it. Uh, you have done this already. If you think about component one, when you went and uh, got real feedback for your user interfaces, that was primary data because you had to go and personally go and do that yourself. You had to c come up with the questions, create the survey, do interviews, and go speak to people and find out what they thought. That is primary. It's done by yourselves. Secondary data, when you think of secondary data, I want you to think about second-hand data, okay? This is data that's collected by organizations or, or other than uh, the people using the data. Um, so, for example, things that you would typically find online, um, on Google. Um, other examples, if you want to do research for um, about population growth in the UK or certain parts of the UK, you could use the data collected by the government. Uh, in the national census, since you haven't uh, have not directly collected this data, it's considered secondary data because it's not done by you; it's done by someone else. It's second hand. Now, uh, hopefully, you can see some of the pros and cons of both types. Using primary data means you have direct control over the data collected, and it's accurate because you're guessing data that you need, and therefore it's specific to what you need it for, and therefore the kinds of questions you ask is linked to what it. Uh, uh, to data and information and knowledge that you require for whatever purpose you have. Um, and you can obviously decide how the, the, the questions are asked and the method and how many people, you know, there's much more control and therefore the accuracy is, you know, far, far better. However, it also means that you need to have the resources available to collect, verify, store and process the same data. In some cases, secondary sources must be used because it is not economically viable to collect primary data, meaning it's just easier to use secondhand information. Most of us will typically want to go on Google for that exact reason, because it's easier. And if you think about it, in most cases, there might be someone else who's already gone and found that information that you require, and therefore you could just use that, piggyback off that effort, rather than you spending your time and money and coming up with the team, speaking to people, and putting all that time, effort, and energy to do it yourself. If that knowledge and data is already out there, it's just easier to do. Yeah? Um, so, for example, actually, I'm going to give you an example right now. You know that later on in this component, you're going to be working with this spreadsheet here, yeah, for the mock. And this is data for Cineworld. So these are the emails of the people and the films. Now, I'm not going to focus too much about the, the whole spreadsheet here because that's going to be done as a lazy video for a different section. What I want you to know is that I had to make this myself because I couldn't give you the real thing because that's not allowed. You're going to, when you start the real thing, you have to do it, uh, uns you know, uh, without any kind of support, independently, uh, and therefore, I need to give you something that's similar to help you with the training process during the mock phase. So, I had to come up with these uh, these uh, films and you know the information that went with this, so the duration of the film, the genre of the film, and the price. Now, the easiest way to do this, the most obvious way uh, that you might say or might think is okay. You know, so I had to sit there and type up all these these names. Yes, and that initially was what I was going to do, and then I realized, wait a minute, let me have a look at how many records there are. So when I scrolled down, I thought, oh my God, there's 500 different records, and there was, it's going to take me too long. So what I did instead is I went online, and I found, I just searched for a list of films done with this information, by the way, you know, in terms of how long each film is, the title, the genre, 
And uh, and luckily, lo and behold, I actually found one. I found a website with this information, and I just copied and pasted it in. I had to tweak it a little bit, but at least the majority of the work was done for me. Now that's second-hand information. Yeah, saved me time and effort, and I get what I need to get a, get out of it. So you can easily see some of the pros and cons of both primary and second data. Now we need to just put it on paper. You have to explain both of them here, explain the difference between them two, the pros and cons between them two, and why both can be used. In what situations can they be used? The next point, discuss the features that must be considered when collecting data. For example, the size of the sample, who was, the sa who was in the sample, where the data, uh, data was collected, when the data was collected, and the methods used. Now, all this is important if you want to make sure that the data is good. Because there's no point looking at something that's 50 years old. If I want to know, um, let's just say I've got uh, a business idea. I want to create, I've come up with a, uh, let's use trainers again. Um, because I've got trainers in my mind for some reason. Let's just say I've got a, a new concept for a pair of trainers. I want to pitch this idea to Nike. And they're going to pay me potentially thousands, hundreds of thousands for this design. The best way to convince them is by proving to them, look, this is what people have said. Not just me, because obviously I want their money, so I want to say whatever I want and to convince them. To persuade them to make it realistic and honest and, 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 and believable, best way to do it is by showing, look, here's what other people have said. So I'd have to do a survey. Now, if that survey, if I'm using second-hand information, secondary data, if a survey is from information done by a company 50 years ago, then it's not going to be appropriate because people's tastes change over time. How can I sell a potentially you know, multi-million pound idea to someone and, and convince them to give me hundreds and thousands of pounds if my convincing argument is using data from 50 or 100 years ago? It doesn't make any sense. So this is why when the data was collected is important. Yeah, uh, Where the data was collected is important as well. So for example, if the trainers... Uh, actually, let's use a different example now. I'm going to talk to you about cultural differences because it's just an easy thing to talk about. Um, in this side of the world, um, we're a bit more open and free to certain types of clothing, yeah, because you know we're used to seeing those kind of clothing. So, for example, we'll be used to seeing certain uh, bathing wear, yeah, swimwear, uh, and and things like that of that nature, on billboards, on posters, on TV, on the websites, and so on and so forth. So coming up with a new design like that, coming up with a new campaign, a marketing scheme, a strategy and selling it over here in this side of the world makes sense because that's the norm here and it will work. If, however, I'm coming up with a new design and or I'm trying to convince someone it's not going to work and then I say, look, here's my here's my evidence, here's my proof and I show 100 people, 1,000 people, 10,000 people. 90% uh, of them or 80% of them, which is still a high, you know, high percentage, have said that they don't like this design. But the people that I'm using uh, and the surveys were done in a, let's just say, a more moderate country, for example, Saudi Arabia, then of course the company will say, well, you know, Mr. Ali, that, that's, that's not fair. That's an unfair representation of the data that you've used because you're showing what people think over there you want to sell or we want to sell something over here so surely we need to do surveys uh, with people from the same place we want to sell so that's the reason why the where is important so where and when um, the sample size again <laughs> let me give you an example um, I often watch the drug uh, sorry not dragons then uh, watch that as well but the the apprentice and there's always one project um, task where they have to do some um, market research. They come up with an idea, a product, they go service, they go out into the public, they show it to the people, they show the advert and they, they ask them what they think. Now, they're very clever with the words that they use because what they tend to say is 90% of, uh, no, let's say 60%, 66% 60, of people asked, thought this was a an amazing product and it will sell. But 66% um, of uh, three people is two out of three, right? Or you could say 50% thought it was amazing. But that could mean you've asked two people and one said they liked it, right? Now, if you're saying one person liked it out of two people you've asked, that's not enough people. Now, if they came back and said, actually, we asked a thousand people 
and 500 said they liked it. Fair enough. That's that's a lot of num. That's a lot of you know. That's that's a bigger number. 500 people have said they like something. So 50% there makes more sense. So the size of the sample, sample by the way, if you don't know, is how many people you've asked. So the bigger the sample, it means the more people you've asked. Okay. So if it's a small sample, it means you've only asked a small group of people. One, two, three, four, five, whatever it might be. A big sample means you've asked a lot more people. Now you can obviously understand why. In the ideal world, you'd want to ask a bigger sample. But the problem with the bigger sample is that it takes longer. Yeah, if you have to ask a thousand people, that's going to take a long time to figure out, to do, and get those answers back, and then to make sense of it, to actually get some information out of it. You know, some actionable information or knowledge. And then, of course, who was in the sample? And again, th this is um, important because, well, let me put it another way. Um, okay, music. Okay, in this day and age, you know, there's so many different types of music. Same thing with games, films. You know, there's different genres, different artists. Um, and if you ask me what I like at my age group, uh, coming from the generation that I come from. I may or may not like the kind of music that you like. That doesn't mean I'm right and you're wrong or vice versa. It just means we have different tastes. Now, if you are trying to become a... Let's just say you went to your parents, yeah? And this is probably the easiest way to understand this. Imagine you went to your parents and you said, right, I want to quit school and I want to become a rapper. Or some other musician, some other uh, artist, musical artist. And your parents said you're never gonna make it. Not trying to be dis dis not trying to dishearten you or anything like that. But let's just say they said, look, we're worried. We want you to have a backup plan at least. Do this first. Go to university and then do that if you want to on the side, right? And and you're 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 convinced. You're saying no, sorry, no, I don't want to do that. I want to put it 100%. Put all my heart and soul into it. I want to go get out of education and go into this. But then you come up with the deal, and your parents say, look, let's do, let's do a survey. Let's ask. I'm gonna ask a few people, and and we'll see if what you have on offer is attractive and actually will sell so you come up with a mixtape or something else you record something and then they go and use that with their survey so they go and find a sample meaning they go and find some people to ask these questions now you would say if they come back and say sorry 100 percent of people they asked said sorry it's rubbish that you don't have a talent that you won't make it as a rapper they didn't like it at all surely the first thing you'd ask is who did you ask who did you go and ask? Who did you go and show my mixtape to? And who did who listened to it? What kind of people were they? What kind of background did they have? And this is what this is about. Who was who were they? Who was in the sample? Because if your parents in that situation went and asked people of their age or older, here's what what, what do you think? And they're not into that kind of music. Then of course you're going to turn around and say, well that's not fair again because that's not my target audience. That's not who I would be aiming for. You know if you went and showed that to other teenagers and ask 50 teenagers from different schools and see what they thought put it onto Facebook put it online put it on YouTube whatever it is and let's see how many likes it get then you can say that's a fairer representation because there's different people in there and more specifically it's got the, the type of people your target audience in there if you're aiming to create a pair of trainers for kids and you, all you do is ask uh, adults about their opinions then that's a not that's not a wise move to make so you can see why there's so much more thinking involved when it comes to finding the data in the first place. Yeah, we've not even looked at the data, you know, the dashboard yet. We're not even looking at Excel yet. This is just talking about information and how information is collated from da the data that's being used. So make sure you talk about these features here. And again, everything you need is on page 78 and 79 in the textbook should you need to look at it. Now, there's a, another really good table at the uh, bottom of page 78 talking about the methods that could be used, uh, how large a sample should be, who's the uh, sh who should be in the sample, why, uh, where you take the data from, and when you took the data is so important. I've basically explained it as briefly as I can, but if you want a little bit more help, look at the page 78 for that information. Now, before I finish this video, I'm going to talk about this here big data so now you need to talk about you need to give a definition of big data meaning what is big data with examples and then you need to uh, think about the pros and cons of using such kind of data yeah this kind of data 
So, to put simply, boys and girls, big data refers to, to the way in which many organizations collect large quantities of data. Much of this is collected automatically by the organization's transaction processing systems, such as e-commerce websites or supermarket checkout systems. Big data typically involves systems that contain very large volumes of data, includes many different varieties of data like text, images, audio, video, and requires data to be processed very quickly. Large volumes of data of data are collected by many systems that people interact with daily. Social media websites, supermarkets, mobile networks, digital uh, television, e-commerce websites, uh, search engines, uh, cash machines and Wi-Fi access points. The data collected by these systems is often used to analyze customer habits and interests. This information can be used to build detailed customer profiles which can be used for targeted adverts. You may have noticed that if you search for an item or uh, browse for it on an e-commerce website, adverts for that same or similar item will start to appear on other websites. This data can be uh, can also be used to, to identify purchasing trends such as items that are often purchased together, which can be used by retailers in store layout and advertising. I mean... It happens all the time and you may not even realize it. You search for something on Google, then you go into Facebook and see an advert for those items or something similar to it. Um, or, for example, some of you may, or your parents may go to places like Tesco and you have a club card and they use a club card and then a few weeks later or a month later they get a leaflet through the post with vouchers for items that they have purchased in the past, specifically, you know, to do those, those items them, themselves. It could be specific types of cheese, milk, Kellogg's Frosties, it could be anything at all. And you'll notice that it's specific. It's not just a, it's not just a random list of items. It is things that your parents have bought, actually, actually purchased. So the question is, how did they know? And it's basically because of the scanning that takes place. Now, people, when people scan in their club cards, yes, you're earning points and they're giving you discounts. What you don't realize, though, or you may, some of you might realize, but what happens in the background is they're basically giving permission for companies like Tesco to save a copy of what it is that you're buying, when you purchase and how often you purchase it. Because by with that information, one, the company like Tesco can uh, predict how much of that stuff they need because they can see buying habits from a whole list of customers. But not only that, but they can send adverts, posters, vouchers to the same customers for things that they've purchased in the past. And that's more realistic. Uh, and, and, and not realistic, sorry, what's the word I'm looking for? More... Um, useful and efficient for a company like Tesco because we'll think about it printing off leaflets and vouchers costs companies money they have to spend time you know, to and, and time and money to pay to uh, someone to come up with these leaflets to print them off then send them for the post so that is wasted resources if all people do is they come home one day they see something in the post and they see a spam now if it's spam they just throw in the bin right that's what most people do but if it's targeted meaning it's leaflets and posters or uh, vouchers for things people definitely buy and use then customers are more likely to open that letter up rather than throwing it in the bin and not only that but they're more likely to go and actually use it as well all of a sudden that time and money being spent isn't wasted it's an investment because what you've basically done is tesco's manipulated in essence, manipulated that person to go and buy the same product from you rather than someone else. Okay, so that's been done with big data. So I've just given you an example there. So please look at page 79 for big data, page 78 for the these three sections here. Explain each one with examples, pros and cons, and explain why.